I think we'll start this off. Can you all hear me? Brilliant. And um, thanks for coming along. Um, I don't know. Were all of you here earlier in the session? So there will be some. There might be some elements of kind of duplication to what you've heard earlier. But we're good. So we're we're focusing in now on on crowdfunding. And I am very honoured to have with me Andrew Hetherington from Fundit.ie and Jeannie Finlay, who is the producer and director and everything of Sounded Out, which is a, um, a crowdfunded project which has done brilliantly well internationally. So um, I think the, probably the best thing to do is for each of us to um, have a chat about um, our areas of um, of expertise. I, I'm here, I'm Maya Darrington from Still Films, and I'm just going to talk a bit about the fact that we have had two, um, two separate projects which we ran through um, different crowdfunding sites, and I'm going to talk about the kind of very different experiences of those two projects. Um, so after that, we can then open things up to, to you guys, and just if you wouldn't mind, um, first of all, kind of wait until you have the microphone before speaking, um, and secondly, passing on the microphone to, to the next person who wants to speak after that. Um, so I'm going to begin by handing over to Andrew. Andrew, it'd be great if you could just kind of talk us through crowdfunding in general, but also specifically about Fundit. Okay. Um, everyone can hear me as well, uh, I hope. <laughs> um, thank you for having me here. I'm um, with Fundit.ie, which is uh, a crowdfunding site based here in Ireland. Um, we are just over six months old um, and have successfully had 73 projects funded on the site um, and raised a total of uh, almost €250,000 in six months for different creative projects across all the creative industries here um, and a good chunk of uh, film and TV related projects. Um, our story is uh, it'll be probably a little bit like uh, Jeannie's story, that fund, crowdfunding is, um, is a, a time-consuming process and this has been in, in development for almost two years now where we had seen the rise of crowdfunding websites around the world um, and seen the very good bits and the very uh, bad bits uh, about some of them. Um, and I think it's really important to, to focus on that aspect that crowdfunding is a is a, is a labor intensive but also a very fulfilling um, audience engagement exercise um, and I think from some of the cases that we have we'll see that um, from my perspective though seeing what the project all of these amazing projects do and, and go um, what happens after they fundraise on the site is a really fulfilling thing to, to, to see um, uh, as I said, um, uh, we're only in our infancy, but uh, we have a, a really great success rate on the site, which is, I think, far ahead of a lot of our international peers. Um, and part of the reason to that is, is because of that is, is, is the fact that it's Irish. And Ireland is well known as a, as a country where people give regularly um, low amounts of money to projects and causes that they really believe in. Um, and uh, our research leading up into the developing funders had echoed that um, we're also in a time where finding funding is also a lot, uh, a lot more difficult um, across all creative industries. Um, and this provides a way for everyone who has anything from five euro up to millions of euros to give to a project that they are uh, interested in. I would say that crowdfunding as an entity is when you engage with uh, your audience or an audience for the project that you are developing um, and typically you probably engage with uh, about 200 or maybe 300 people that will give in or around um, 40 to 50 euro in our case and um, other websites there's a different average pledge but that means that you can do things and um, you can get seed capital to develop an idea you can actually get some of the more hefty production costs fundraise from your crowd um, and your audience who are interested in seeing what you're doing. Um, and uh, that is, in essence, fund uh, crowdfunding. Um, you are trying to engage your audience. You are trying to get them to give a relatively reasonable amount of money to your campaign. And in some other cases, maybe not. You're just asking for a little bit of money and uh, they get to see the, the, the project come to life. 
Um, so rewards are important, but the project and, and the person and the process of running the crowdfunding campaign are really the key um, to being successful on the site. Um, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about that in a few more minutes. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, I know when we started out on, on our funded campaign, which was um, it's, it's for a project called Where Were You, which is about street style in Dublin, the, our first port of call was to refer to Jeannie's um, promo, which she had put together for her own funding campaign. And for me, it was kind of the ultimate successful crowdfunding um, uh, model to look to. So I'm, I'm going to hand it Yeah, it, we, I thought it was perfect. Sub subject matched content. So do you want me to talk to you? I'd love you okay. to, to tell us about how you kind of how you how you first came to crowdfunding and, and what it did for your project. Um, okay. Apologies if I'm repeating things that I've said in previous panels. Okay, so here's my website for Sun It Out. It's our current crowdfunding campaign. It's gone up since this morning, it's amazing. <laughs> um, uh, okay, let me just find in the partners thing. I wrote an article, so if you go on standout.com and go in the partners, I wrote an article for director's notes. Um, basically, I made loads of mistakes making the film. Um, as I've said before, I worked for a year with no money and then decided that this was a film that I thought there was an audience for and that I didn't need a lot of money to make it work. So I launched the first crowdfunding campaign. It was interesting actually, I decided to work with Indiegogo because they were the only crowdfunding site I knew of at that time where people without an American um, bank account could accept donations because um, Kickstarter's US only. Um, and I put a tweet out and said, has anyone tried crowdfunding? And Danae Ringelman, who's the CEO of Indiegogo, got back to me within five minutes and I sent her my campaign. I wrote this really lengthy, worthy, I'm great, please come. No, it wasn't I'm great, it was like, I really like it, please come my film. And it was really apologetic. And um, I just put the trailer up. I was like, my art will sell my film. <laughs> and, um, and she kind of gave me feedback and said, keep it short, find big partners, find people to help cheerlead on your behalf and talk to this guy. And she put me in touch with this really kind of ballsy... New York, New Jersey filmmaker who made a short called Cerise, John Trigonis, and um, I, he gave me all this feedback, and I was really incensed. He kind of said, "Well, you've written too much, and your spelling's terrible, and <laughs> no one's going to fund a trailer, and people are going to fund you." So I got really cross with him, and then after about, I put this thing up ran for about 20 days and we raised nothing, like a few people that I knew funded the film. But I didn't want to be in a situation where it was my friends funding my film because as far as I'm concerned, filmmakers funding other filmmakers is not audience engagement and it's not sustainable. So I bit the bullet. I'm really camophobic. The fact that there's cameras in here now is making me feel <laughs> a bit bad. But I, so I did a video where I just said, this is what crowdfunding is. It's a sponsored swim, but you get a film. <laughs> Give a little or, or a lot. And I feel passionate about this film. So I cut it together and we set a target of $3,000 or something. And we made four and a half. And magical things started to happen. Like I keep saying magical like it's this naive thing. But people funded us from $5. Um, and then someone came on board and gave us $2,000 as an associate producer. At that time, I thought the film was going to be a 40-minute film, and I decided to make some DVDs. Anyway, I'm going to show you the second campaign that I did. Oh, it's a bit squashy, but anyway. <laughs> um, and then I'll show you the new campaign, and I'll talk through how it's all structured. But basically, OK, so at this point, I've raised enough to fund the shoot, and then now I needed to raise the... Hello, I'm Jeannie, the director of Sound It Out, the documentary. I've made films like Golf Cruise for IFC and Team Land for BBC. My new film is Sound It Out, about the very last surviving vinyl record shop in Teesside in the northeast of England. And here we are, 
been um, shooting in the shop. It's an observational documentary about men collecting vinyl records and the importance that music plays in all of our lives. Hello, Sound Art Records. Hi, I'm the only record shop left, yes. I'm the only one left in Teesside now. It is fantastic, but it's sad. It's emotions. It's all about emotions, records. Emotions and memories. Records hold memories. An amazing 67 people from eight different countries helped sponsor the film in the first round. And it's meant that I've been able to spend lots of time in the shop shooting and also going back to people's houses for regular customers and finding out a bit more about their lives. And I've, I've learnt more about what music really means to them. I like me cool. People say I'm mad, but I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't have a woman, so, you know, what more do you want? So I've met people like Shane and DJ Frankie and John Boy. Your DJ Frankie's coming on the bounties inside the old crew. Let's do this! shoot's been brilliant and now I need your support to help finish the film. I need you to help sponsor the film like a sponsored swim. It's very simple, just go on to Indiegogo and you can support the film for the cost of a pint, it's about five dollars. Independent record shops are an endangered species. All of the record shops I grew up with have closed down, so it's really important that we capture Sound It Out while it's So we did this, and we got we got loads of funders this time. Uh, 139 people funded funded the film. Um, then when we got into South by Southwest, we did it again. Um, I was starting to get a bit tired of it and thought, oh my god, we're just like going to a well that is dry. Um, and we we didn't raise all of our money for South by Southwest, and I think it's because I felt a bit embarrassed about asking and I think people thought that they were kind of funding a holiday um, but what we did do we raised two and a half thousand dollars for South by Southwest but we match funded that with skill set money and Northern Film and Media money because um, no I don't think people know that, about this about South by Southwest they don't give you anything mm -hmm. I mean you get a pass you get five passes and they're worth about five hundred dollars each Apart from that, you get nothing. So we had to find somewhere to stay. We took Tom with us, who's in the film. We took St. Saviour, who sings in the film. We had to hire a keyboard, which was a world of pain, um, and get flights. And, you know, it cost us like £8,000 to do it. And it was so important to get there. Um, OK, just bear with me. So, OK, so when we were at South by Southwest, the BFI met with us and said... Um, okay, we want you to crowdfund the distribution of your film, and we just said no, no way, because it's so much work. And then we decided, okay, we can't not do this, it would be silly not to. There's lots of things we've done, I think, which have been successful, and I've noticed other crowdfunding campaigns have pretty much been <laughs> copying wholeheartedly our campaign. But what we've tried to do is be really, to say thank you to the people who've funded our film, but also made it really clear, if people have funded it, to um, thank them. So let me find... So the backers page shows everyone who funded our film. And everyone who funded our film, I've dedicated, I've personally dedicated a video to on Facebook. And they've all been personalised. So Scott Bradbury got Scott Walker. And um, so I picked a song for absolutely everybody and we counted them up. So I think it, we're a bit behind because we've had so many new backers, but I think we're on 428 backers now, so far for the film. So when we did it for the theatrical release, we had to raise $10,000, which is more than we'd ever raised before. So I cut a new video, which is mortifying for me. <laughs> we made the minimum perks bigger because it's quite a lot of administration. We personally email everyone who funds us, says, say thank you, ask them to talk about the film, ask them to talk about the record shop that changed their life and dedicate a video. So it's brilliant, but it's loads of work. And putting out, a, we tried to make the perks really good. So in our pitch, we tried to make the pitch really kind of like, the film's good and one of the 
big bits of advice I got was, don't stop being so British about this. <laughs> You're not begging for money. You're trying to involve people in something brilliant. So the position we've always had is, we love this film, and it's been an amazing journey, and we want you to come with us, rather than, we really need your money. <laughs> Which I think is really um, a big thing to kind of get over. And with us, the, for, the per for us, the perks are really important. So the soundtrack of our lives is, I'm putting, I'm putting out a record on baby blue vinyl with four tracks from the film, <coughs> and they're going to be numbered, and they're special. And part, so part of the money from the crowdfunding will pay for that. Um, so there's lots of maths involved about how much work is it to post them out, mm. how much does it cost to get the DVD, the DVD made and the vinyl made. You know, and posters. We put, the sun, we put this up at $40, but it was too much. No one bought it. But the one that people have... I think the average spend on... This campaign has been $78 is our average donation. So we've, we've, so 68 people have bought the DVD and vinyl and stickers. Tati Divine made us limited edition jewellery that looks like a vinyl necklace. They're brilliant. Oh, here they are. Earrings, necklace. Um, and Crosley gave us some record players. We took them to South by Southwest. And then they became a, um, a perk as well. Um, someone paid for me to go, I'm going to be going and doing a screening in their home <laughs> really soon. <laughs> how, how much was that for? The $500. Book? That's pretty good. Um, so, and what's good is you get the comments. So, of the 164 people that have com contributed this time, 95 have commented. What's interesting about doing crowdfunding is you've got to get a lot of eyes on your project. Our hit rate is 1%. So for every 100 people that visit our crowdfunding page, only one will fund it. So you've had to get 100 people to look at it for just one to fund it. And that's really scary. So how do you direct people to, to this page? What's, what's worked for you? Um, dedicating videos. So no one wants to look at a Facebook page which continually says... Um, uh, our, our projects, um, we're, sorry, no one wants to hear you say, please fund my film in a thousand different ways. Yeah. So, um, when we're not campaigning, I would update the Facebook five times a day with just content that I thought was interesting. So, stuff about vinyl or record shops or whatever. And then when we've started doing the film, we kind of, um, for everyone who donated, we dedicate a video and make it a good video. So you're continually generating content. Um, uh, and also, because we got the P&A money, we, we, got, um, we took a PR person on for this last part of it, and she's done it for like a massively reduced um, fee. And so what she did was get people like Scroobius Pip. Miranda Sawyer is one of our anonymous donors, but it means that she's going to do one of our Q&As and... Um, uh, yeah, just got people to write about the film. But I think part of the thing about this one is not to shout too loud. The film works well when people find it. It's an independent film. So here's, here's the back end. So this is how many people have viewed the page, and that's how much we've raised. So we need one view for each dollar you raise, really. <coughs> Referrals. So you get a unique code for each person. If you log into Indiegogo, you can get a unique referral code, and it's useful because you can see who's raising the money. So that's my referral code. So 72 <laughs> people have clicked on a link that I've provided. So that's me busting my ass. <laughs> like doing, cause, but that's because I run the Facebook page and the Twitter. Mm. Um, and then these are all other people that like the project. So John Bergerman is the guy who's doing the animation on my next film. Oh, okay. But he's got like 10,000 Facebook friends. No, 10,000 Twitter followers. Um, and we kind of talked to people and said that, well, that's brilliant if you write about it, but actually the most convincing thing of all is for someone to say, I funded it and I think you should too, is much better than 
RT, RT, you know, sending stuff on, it just becomes like noise. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, th there's, there's two things that I'd kind of like to, to talk more about coming out of this. Um, one of the things is kind of w what crowdfunding uniquely gives to a project, because as, as well as as well as providing funding, it, I suppose, firstly kind of provides a certain liberty from, fun, from, from traditional funding bodies. Um, but secondly, um, it, it kind of, yeah, it gives you an audience and, and, and makes your, your audience engage from an early stage. So that's something I'd really like to kind of talk about more. But, but the other thing I want to talk about is just kind of managing time. So... For example, Jeannie, as a filmmaker, needs to be working on, on new projects. But obviously, to really make something like this work, you need to give it a lot of time. So I think at this kind of early stage of, of crowdfunding, where we're all kind of trying to, to work out how to, how to make it work for us, it's something we kind of need to explore how, um, yeah, how, to, how to manage that, the time commitment of it. Because... I mean, from, from what I'm hearing from you, you, you've really, you have kind of been dedicated to this for the last, you know, since the film was completed. I started crowdfunding last June. I finished making, the, I did the last shot on the film 11 months ago. Yeah. And I've not really stopped since. I think, I mean, crowdfunding, I don't know what your feelings are about this, but I've kind of, I feel like a bit of a roller coaster with it. Like your crowdfunding campaign, the average, the graph is like this, then yeah. like that, and then like that. So you do really well on day one and day two, then you do nothing, really slowly, little bits and bits and bits, and that's really really hard work, because you feel terrible asking for money is horrible. And then in the last three days it goes, whew, you know, and if you make target, that's when you make target. But um, I think, I think there's ways that you can you can you can change that pattern as well. One of the things that we looked into is is that yes, there is it is a roller coaster. At the beginning, you start off with a, a massive enthusiasm and interest, and people wanting to share the information, um, and then as your campaign grows and um, uh, hopefully grows, and um, you come to a critical point where people. There's this massive attention, and people want to get involved and want to see it get over the line. Um, but that middle point you know, is kind of is the difficult point for everyone, where everyone feels, oh, I'm not getting, I'm not getting anywhere. Um, but there's really, there's really clever things that you can do to get people to donate at different points of time, mm -hmm. and that is really doing the groundwork before you go live mm -hmm. on the site. You can go to some of your 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 collaborators. Like the idea of going with a necklace um, and during your campaign you can say the three people that give over the next couple of hours will get a necklace each will drive a lot of activity at particular points when mm -hmm. you're feeling I'm not engaging with people but if you can bring in things like clever competitions or things like a really great experience that you can actually you can give to someone like in my case I would get invites to to openings of or launches of lots of different creative projects and I, I'm privileged to go out but lots of other people don't get them and so one of the things I do is would you like to come along to me tonight or <coughs> other people have done it is go I've got a ticket to the opening of this film tonight and anyone that pledges to my crowdfunding campaign can take my plus one and you can drive you can drive giving and you can drive interest by by doing very specific little things across, across the campaign. I think a really key thing for, because I think for a while there was a lot of talk, I mean this is, crowdfunding's young in Europe, really, mm. and I think there was talk particularly about a year ago where it was like, oh wow, it's going to save filmmaking for everyone, and I, I don't think that's true at all, because what, <laughs> it's not a case of if you build it they will come. If you build it, they won't come. You've got to bring them. Yeah. And what I've noticed is every time we do a screening um, and I tell people about the film, then we get loads of backers and I get emails saying, I'm funding you. I like your film, but I'm funding you to make it. And that's quite overwhelming as a director. You're like, oh, wow, there is, this isn't just about a project. But I think it has to be the right project 
connecting with the right audience at the right time. Mm. Because there's a lot of projects out there now, and I was talking to someone earlier about a film production company I know, amazing company, brilliant track record. Their perks are a bit not quite right, but the film that they're trying to raise money for is um, a short about an abortion doping scandal in 1970s Russia um, in, gym, in Olympic gymnasts with an unknown director. So there's so many bridges to cross, so many hurdles. And at the moment, last time I looked, they'd raised $25. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really tough because um, do, you, do you believe that they can do it? Well, I'm taking their word for it because I don't know. What have they done before? What's the track record? Mm. And do I feel good when I've funded it? Mm, abortion, not quite sure about that. And it's a short, so what life, I think... If it's the right film, like my friend Anthony Baxter's making You've Been Trumped, and that's a film, Kieran was there, and we did the Edinburgh pitch, and everyone just went, there's no film here, we were not going to fund this, this is a story that's been told. And he crowdfunded it, and, you know, his film has been responsible, they say, for disabling Donald Trump's presidential campaign. The audience wanted it to happen. So outside of politics of commissioners, he made his film and he is reaching an audience and now he's about to take it internationally. He's winning awards everywhere. And that film would not have existed if it wasn't for crowdfunding. And, and actually similarly, um, Jeannie's film wouldn't have Oh existed. it wouldn't. My, there's no way I would have made my film. Mm. No way. Because, yeah, you were telling me yesterday what the response was from the commissioners. Um, yeah, I, I've pitched the film once and to the BBC. And they were like, mm, yeah, it's not that interesting. The shot's quite charming, but there's no film here. Maybe a 20 minute short, but, you know. And it would have been workshopped and pitched, and I would have wanted to kill myself. But also, <laughs> the film just wouldn't have been made, and the people in the film wouldn't have made it in film. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the kind of interesting thing about, about the, the liberty which crowdfunding gives you, that within commissioning there are all these kind of set rules that, that you know when you, when you go along to a pitch. You know, you've got to, I don't know, you've got to have strong characters with new stories, blah, 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 blah whatever, whatever these kind of old cliches are. But, but to a certain extent, those rules... Um, result in every documentary that's out there following a certain kind of format and and I think it's potentially quite kind of crushing of the kind of the future of films and documentaries whereas with something like like this you can present something which which has a different level of originality and a different approach and it won't instantly be kind of be um, struck off the list because it doesn't tick all the key points that, that commissioners are looking for. So I think similarly for us with, with Where Were You, the, the Dublin Street Style project, um, th yeah, that, that's really kind of worked to our advantage. Like um, we submitted it to RTE and it was, you know, in the usual way, it was kind of dismissed as of not having public interest. And what we found immediately from um, the moment that our crowdfunding campaign began was that, of course, there was huge public interest and huge... Um, I suppose not even in, in see, just seeing the end film, but kind of in being involved in, in making the film. And of course, now, um, you know, th there is interest from RTE in, in seeing the final product because we have a kind of proven audience. So, so crowdfunding has, has worked in the perfect way, which it has the potential to do um, to that extent. I mean, at the same time, in order to make a film, obviously you need kind of much higher budgets than you can necessarily, that, that, that maybe you can achieve um, initially on, on a crowdfunding um, campaign. But I suppose the, the hope is that you can get a film running and, and find funders um, through the proven popularity that you gain through a crowdfunding site. Yeah, I, 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 there's, there's lots of cases on, on the website of people that have, have put up their, their campaign and they've got to the point of being funded and then other opportunities present mm. themselves because they've, they've spent the time developing that audience and from private investors c coming out of the woodwork and, and giving quite a large chunk of money towards 
a number of different projects on the site. And kind of this, this interest that's growing around, like crowdfunding is so new um, to the vast majority of people and this concept is a little bit of a leap for, for some people, especially in, in, in kind of the, the older generations. They go, um, I don't quite get this. Um, or there's a kind of technological gap of how do I give money to it. So you have to be really flexible in, in how you go about a crowdfunding campaign. You've got to, you've got to talk offline as well as talk mm -hmm. online to people so that everyone that is interested in what you're doing has the opportunity to hear about it or to understand what you're doing. I think it's really important though that, that this balanced view of, of crowdfunding is maintained, that it's not it is not the answer to everyone's um, everyone's needs um, from this technological gap. People that aren't um, as savvy with things like Facebook or Twitter or or social any type of social media, crowdfunding really isn't the right route for them to go down. Um, it can be if they have a network of very interested people um, that have the capacity to give, and and that's the other thing you need to do. You need to do that little bit of thought about. Do I think I have the people that could give to, to this campaign before you, you, you jump into it? Um, could, they, could they give? Is there someone out there that I know could give quite substantially? You give those 500 euro or $500 gifts and are interested in seeing mm. um, the reward at that level. And that's, uh, that's really why we spend a w an average, I think, about an hour and a half with each project before it goes live on the site. Um, and then another series of, of mm -hmm. kind of check-in points during their campaign to make sure that they're, they're doing things logically, that they've thought about their campaign before they go onto the site. And um, my colleague Dara, who's here with me today, does a lot of this kind of preparation of people before they're, they're jumping into a fundraising campaign. And that's really vital. You, you, you've got to think about <coughs> fundraising, and that's what you are doing. And you've got to, rea you do have to realize that that takes time. You've got to, to put in the hours at times when people are engaged online. Like, like mornings on your way to work is a great time <coughs> to talk to people when they're sitting on a bus or sitting in traffic on the way to work, and um, on their way home from work, and at lunchtime when they have time to, to, to look at what's going on online. There are all the things you need to think about. Um, in our case, to give a little bit of insight and to fund it, um, your, your um, direct email link is really high, so that means that you are doing a lot of emailing to specific people, asking them in a personal way, can you give? Yeah, that's my, but that's also because I run the Facebook and the Twitter, mm -hmm. so that link. Combines all of them. Yeah, all what's right. interesting actually is that with Sally's link, we, we've spent a bit of money on Facebook ads, and we put her, direct link to see. Guess how much money it raised? None. Not Nothing. much. Yeah. Yeah. Not a penny. <laughs> yeah. It's a waste of money. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Facebook ads um, are, are not, the, not the route. If you're going to talk on, on Facebook about a project, you want to develop the story of the project. Mm. It's not a, a request for funding. It is about the team that's involved, what mm. you did today, um, and linking that through to the crowdfunding project that you're doing, um, yeah. and making making the, that ask for money relate to what is the creative output of Totally. I mean, but it's quite interesting because you kind of think, oh, maybe that would work. It's quite good to know it doesn't. Yeah. Just <laughs> never anyone's waste a penny on it. On it. <laughs> it's rubbish. <laughs> but we, we ran um, two campaigns, actually, at the same time within Still Films. So half of Still Films was working on a Buzz Bank project and half of us were working on the Fundic project. And, and one of the kind of key differences for us what, for those of us who, who were working on the Fundit project was that we had Andrew to hand to kind of advise us as, as we went along. And that made a kind of, well, I suppose that was one of the things that made a key difference because initially we were sort of doing this thing of just bombarding people with emails. Like all of us would send emails at the same time saying, please do this and we'd all be posting at face, on Facebook at the same time. But after an early meeting with Andrew, we scrapped all that and actually kind of worked out a kind of, a calendar broken down you know within the hours of the day about what would happen when so that so that the people you know our audience were kind of receiving new news all the time and didn't feel that whenever they saw anything with our names on that they should just shut down because they'd already heard that news because I think that's kind of the danger and I think with the buzz bank campaign that was part of why it didn't work for us it was an unsuccessful campaign the, the fact that people felt a bit kind of bludgeoned and 
yeah, they, they felt they were kind of hearing from us too much about the same thing over and over again. Is this all by way. email? It was well. It was wow. email, Facebook, and and Twitter. And so, but basically, we just what we yeah we realised staggering was a kind of key thing. But not just staggering time wise, but staggering in terms of approach and content. Um, but also with Buzzbank, it's certainly Buzzbank is a UK site, and um, I think that yeah. I mean, it, we could kind of explore a long time why that didn't work. I, I feel that we didn't find the kind of correct hook that made people engage with the project. But secondly, um, we certainly got a lot from, uh, through Fundit, from the way that Ireland works, the way that Ireland kind of is a place of networks, mm -hmm. you know, everyone, you can kind of connect everybody um, via a certain number of, of links. So. I think, yeah, the nature of the project was that it was um, about the general public of Ireland and the general public of Ireland kind of responded in that way, whereas for Buzzbank, um, we just didn't get, um, yeah, no one noticed that, that, that our campaign was there and certainly no one felt that it was about them or for them or rel relevant in any way to them. Now, I've just seen there that, we've, that we're kind of running out of time, so we should, we should open out questions to the audience. Do any of you have anything you'd like to talk about or you'd like to ask about? Just maybe about the... Um, sorry, could you make sure that you speak into the mic? Okay. Sorry, sorry. Just maybe about... Um, uh, you talked about RT and the broadcasters. Is that yeah. Okay? Um, I suppose, as in how do RT think that they're getting a project for cheap, if you know what I mean? As if, in, if it was funded. If it was funded separately, and then they, like, as in, are they getting it for cheaper than, let's say, you would have budgeted for well, in, in my experience of the national broadcaster at the moment, they're, they're always looking for ways of getting a kind of a cheaper version of what they would otherwise have got. And that's not necessarily their fault that their budgets have been dramatically cut and they are under obligation to try to find ways of doing things more cheaply. I mean, in reality, probably the amount that we would need to complete a television documentary um, after Fund It would not be that different from the original amount we would have been sourcing because yeah i mean well from from my experience that the, the the kind of the amount that we raised is really only enough to kind of to source further funding not to actually necessarily make the the finished project but mind you Jeannie's experience completely contradicts that because she has managed to make this amazing film you know on on those funds so it proves but that it can was be done. you know i've not been paid that's yeah. dependent on me filming on my own, yeah. with all my own kit, yeah. in the local shop, and um, sleeping at my parents' house, and them helping me with the childcare. Um, and, I mean, the <coughs> fact that it was crowdfunded meant that all the <coughs> record labels, it was really transparent, so the record labels could kind of see that there wasn't any money, so that enabled to um, get the payments in a way that we wouldn't have done. Um, but yeah, I knew that it would work for this film because I knew I didn't need a lot of money to make it. But also, we took on a, a guy um, called James Colley from November Films as a distribution consultant really, really early on. And he had a film called Beyond Bebo and he, distributed, he made more money on poster sales than on DVD for his film in the 30... Um, 30 screen tour, and um, he was just brilliant, really, really early on. So, um, if we've ever wanted to have those difficult discussions with someone about what's the real value of this, we put James on it, so I don't have to discuss it. And it's a lot easier for him to ask for <coughs> real money for stuff, because, you know, everyone, Sally's worked for next to nothing, I've not been paid, but I think, I think the film will make, it, will make its money back. Um, so it's a, it's a long term. Oh yeah, I mean I'm not doing this. To, this is a, a for love project. Yeah, it really is. And there's, there's, there are also cases where people in their their, their campaign, the budget that they have, they do. I have to spend time on this, and, and, and the more the more crowdfunding gets developed, people are realizing right. There is a chunk of time at the end of this project where I'm going to have to fulfil the awards, and that's going to come out of the 
pause somewhere and it's going to take out of me with the production process. So people are going, right, how do I, how do I build in into my target a, a fee for, for the time that it takes to run this campaign as well as create to the project? And if you, you've got to, you, I guess you've got to, have to maintain a balance. Some people want, want to fund the pure creativity of what you're doing and, and get the project happening. But then there are lots of other people that realize that it just does take time to do things and your time is a value as well. So they realize that giving a little bit of money towards the time is actually going to help get that project finished and get the rewards that you've given. Um, so I think as, as the audience for crowdfunding develops, that sophistication should develop. And it's up to kind of people that have been successful at it and the websites to make that inform people about everything that goes on behind the scenes in delivering the project. And from, from our case, that's, that's how we are, are trying to inform the public through case studies on the knowledge that will pop up on, on regular sequences where we're just finishing the, the still times one. And it gives the behind the scenes. So this is six months down the line. What are the things that we faced? What are the problems? What are the really great stories that we can make? And it gives that insight to people how, how do I get how do I get this successfully done and what are the things that I have to keep in mind three months down the line or six months down the line or maybe even two years down the line when the, your film might get taken off to an international festival and you suddenly have to find yourself find the front money to take it there or or the fees for you to have a team of people to go there. There's, there's lots of ways that you can get news those insights and go on to further campaigns and be really, really great at doing it. And I'm trying to It's just that people really need to think about the maths when they're, you know, the figures because a lot of submissions come in and people think, okay, if I got five grand, I'd be able to do my thing. But what they don't, because I, we speak to every single person on the phone, like it is a natural phone call, not an email scenario. So we know kind of exactly what they're thinking and they're often not really actually thinking about the bit that they have to do, which is delivering the rewards, which do cost money and time, more importantly. But the other thing is that there is a fee on every single crowdfunding site. You know, there's, you know, um, a, a processing fee, there's credit card charges. And increasingly, I think, uh, as a, it's a sign of the times we're living in, a lot of the credit card pledges are not actually going through necessarily. So there could, you know, you've got to kind of build in that there could be a, a two, three, four percent failure rate. Um, so, uh, like, I just find I'm constantly kind of people change their their maths. Let's just say after talking to, to us, um, and they're not really thinking about the rewards. All they're thinking about is the money for the project, of course. But you know, it's very, very important to sort of keep your side of the bargain and not promise things you can't deliver. Yeah, I mean, from, from our point of view, just because of the way, say, that our company works, we, we ran our funder campaign and then all of us went into a, a chunk of, of work on other projects. So we didn't immediately begin to contact our, our funders because we weren't actually immediately working on that, that project. And that was a mistake, basically, that, that suddenly your funders kind of feel that you've just taken the money and run and abandoned them. You know, they're, they're not necessarily okay with the way that development works, that there might be a gap, that, you know, etc. So, um, so yeah, that's definitely something to kind of factor in. I mean, in a small company like ours, I mean, most small companies, you don't have to kind of an admin person always available to kind of, to, to for example, I don't know, um, to, to stay in contact with those funders in between times. But really, it is something which we, we recognise, you know, that we'll have to find a way to, to do, however caught up we are in, in other projects in the meantime. Uh, are any of you kind of involved in crowdfunding campaigns at this stage or planning? We're, we're, we're <laughs> sorry. 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 Um, I'm part of a filmmaking company called, and uh, we've just become aware of crowdfunding like a week ago. Um, we love the idea, but we don't really know enough about it. It's something we'd like to try. But I like your point that you were saying that you could use it to gauge interest as well as 
funds that you can demonstrate to distributors or to uh, commissioners that there is interest there. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend doing it just to gauge interest or would it, the main point really be funding? I think, I think it's both. I think yeah. you, don't, you don't separate either of those things. Um, what, what crowdfunding does for, for any type of project is that it's a, it's a pre-sales or a, a pre-marketing mechanism for, for whatever your project is. Um, and that is, is the focus of what you should be, should be doing in terms of talking about the project. But also relating back to the funding you need. Um, I think we all get caught, in Ireland particularly, we get caught up in this kind of funding process that I have to find the funding to do this project. And when you go down the traditional route, where this is bringing, uh, um, going down the traditional route means developing the project and then going into the, the kind of communication process and the sales process. This is the two going hand in hand right from the very beginning that you are generating that interest right from the, almost the point of idea coming into your head that uh, I see people now tweeting and, and Facebook, you know, I'm considering doing a crowdfunding campaign about this project, what type of rewards would you be interested in? And starting the conversation that way, and I think that's a really clever use of, of your time to, to, if you're thinking of a crowdfunding campaign, that you start the conversation about that, that, that crowdfunding area and see what people would be interested in, if they're interested in the topic and doing market research ultimately. So, just one other question actually, would you recommend, uh, you were saying as well, offline activities might be necessary for people that might not be uh, okay with crowdfunding or not really from the internet? Or, it's, it's, um, it's a fact that there's a lot of people that are still very skeptical about putting money into the internet and uh, there are people that are, are very okay with it and will do it. Um, but then there is an audience that aren't as comfortable with it. And, and sometimes you are talking to parents or parents' friends or, or people that are, are a little bit older and they just don't do that at all. So you've got to figure out a way that you can engage the audience that isn't as keen with online transactions to give it a there, There's actually a project on the site at the moment that's based in Tipperary. And, um, basically, you know, people are coming up giving the person who put the project live cash. And she is using her credit card to to fill up her, you know, target or whatever. So and there is ways around it. I mean it's perfectly legitimate to and actually another project, the film project only went over the line I think yesterday or the day before. They brought themselves over the line with the proceeds of the pub quiz. You know, so it isn't you know, so like money comes from all sorts of places. It is is the thing. It's not always kind of, you know, individuals giving credit card numbers and whatever. So you would recommend like lots of offline activities like quizzes or Well I mean it's up to it, it depends on how your campaign is going. I mean these guys really needed a grant to pull themselves over the line so obviously at the last minute they thought okay and let's have a pub quiz and they got the money. And so and that's about having a, a plan in place for your fundraising. So what happens if I'm halfway through the campaign and I haven't really I haven't really managed to, to gain the, the, the interest um, and that we would hope we would have dealt with that well before and in terms of uh, we'll talk to you, we'll, we'll go through the campaign, we'll suggest things that you do well before you go up on site and then the whole things that you can do during during the campaign. Um, but you do have to think about how do, how do I how do I raise funds from multiple sources if I need to, especially if you're looking for a large chunk of money. The, the typical project on our site it's probably in around four to five thousand euros, and that it may not be enough money for what you want to do. So if it isn't, you need to, to think about how do I raise the money for that extra? Are you only looking for ten thousand euro? Am I looking for twenty thousand euros? Where would I get a large chunk of that money if I needed to halfway through my campaign? And it always sounds a little bit better on the site as well if you can say we have X. From you know, you got so many thousand from here. What we need to make our film is for, you know, because suddenly people are kind of thinking, okay, well, someone else actually has you know, believes in this, so we're just pulling these guys over the line rather than having this enormous target that is actually, you know, incredibly difficult to reach in, in a relatively short period of time, you know. And the people who've got the kind of 20 grand projects on the site are very high profile. People who have huge networks. 
the best thing you can do um, in terms of pre-planning is to look at other projects on, on different websites that you think may be similar to yours. Maybe the still films had a look at another crowdfunding campaign and saw that it was successful. There, they looked at the rewards, they looked at the interest. Uh, and you've got to, I mean, you've got to consider the price points of your rewards as well. In still films case, I think the vast majority of funds were below 40 euro. So that shows you what your audience's spending profile is. And some campaigns that we had add up to like a 200 euro average um, pledge on their site, which is much bigger. And that shows the financial capacity of their audience. And you've really got to think about the demographic, how much do you think they would give, and the types of rewards that would interest them in order to, to be successful. Sorry, is there another question here? Sorry, I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of, obviously it looks like there's a lot of people who've kind of uh, invested in this kind of way in which to, to get funding. And, uh, it, would there be a problem with saturation in terms of that if, you're, if there's a lot of kind of requests for uh, people to kind of uh, put money in uh, in terms of crowdfunding and so on? Would it be better to, to do it on your own or to, to use some of the, the websites that are currently open? Like uh, in terms of if you had a website for the film that you're trying to put together uh, and to, to incorporate some sort of a crowdfunding uh, mechanism on, in that uh, website, what I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, uh, from, from our perspective, we'd like everyone to go on to fund it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, think, I think you can, you can tell. It's really great looking at the insights of some of the other crowdfunding websites to see the success rate in relation to particular articles. Film internationally is one of the, the biggest successful art forms that are, are crowdfunding uh, and music. But there is naturally a, a, like an unsuccessful rate as well. Um, and people then may decide that they go and do it themselves. It's quite easy to put a PayPal button on your website and then have the rewards there that people can use. But um, from our perspective, um, what our website is gradually doing is developing this what we call like a super user or a super loved um, person on our site that actually goes in, funds one, has a look at another one, funds that, or actually over the course of a couple of months sees a lot of different projects that they like. Um, and that's from our perspective. Everyone is important on our side. But the idea that someone who's interested in a film project might also be interested in a design project or an event that's happening is is um, is where uh, the potential I think lays. You have to you've got to engage lots of people that you might not know that might have different interests, and um, by being on a, a single platform um, where all of these projects are visible. But I mean, that is a model which has been used internationally by the film makers, actually. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the film. I, I went along to a talk by two filmmakers who had um, almost entirely funded their film um, about Iranian street children through that means. And they, they well, for example, they offered um, as one of the rewards that people would get a credit on the film um, and special invites to screenings. And yeah, it, it worked really well for them. I mean, it was even more time consuming, obviously, than doing it through an existing site. And, and also you've got the issue of kind of, I suppose, gaining your um, audience's trust, like, you know, in terms of, of handling the money or whatever, which, like, to, to be honest, I don't know that it would pay off as an individual to do that, because I think it would probably just add into your workload, which might be better sure. used making your film, basically. But yeah, definitely it has happened elsewhere. Uh, in terms of like if you're producing a film and you're going to use this method, um, how much of the content of the film do you need to sort of give away? I mean, do you, is there was there ever a time in which you wanted to sort of keep some of the actual uh, product secret and or or at least reveal it at the end? And uh, did you feel a pressure to kind of give away a lot of the you know, while we were going along, just those kind of practical things. Um, well, that trailer you saw was something I'd put together while I was still making the film. And I think that only a few seconds of the trailer didn't make it into the final film. Uh, you've got to try and tell the story of your film in the best way possible. It's not like there's a big plot spoiler. Um, 
Yeah, I guess I guess this process means that you reveal more early on than you would do normally, but you have to feel you, know, you have to feel differently about it because it's really scary. It's like um, here's this film I'm making that I hope will be okay. I hope it's gonna be alright. Does this feel okay? Is it gonna be better? It's gonna be graded. It'll be mixed. But here it is, and because you've got to make the best case possible. So, I, th I think yeah, it depends. The, the audience, I think, is interested in the filmmaking process as well. Those are kind of often people love to have that sense of going behind the scenes and seeing something which isn't graded and isn't mixed, and yeah, that they that they are taking part earlier than they normally would. So kind of the, the yeah, getting kind of beyond the mystique of the finished film is one of the kind of is, is one of the biggest rewards, I think. Sometimes though, it's okay to just put up as your video other work that you've done. It doesn't actually have to relate. I mean, that one there, Trasok, that just went live. They just give a paragraph describing the plot of the film, but they don't actually have any material to show on the video yet. So they showed a kind of a compilation of four different films that they made before, purely just so people could see the quality of their work. So you know that's okay too. In that case, it, it brings it back to the person, and the person is really, really key. And you've got, you've got your own network, and it's your, it's you that is uh, talking to people and asking them to, to give money. So you don't have to give any content away. Um, it's, it's you and your idea. Yeah, I think they. Indiegogo puts stats out and you'll make more money if you've got four people on your team. They make 165% more money. And also, um, if you put yourself in the video, you'll make more money. Um, but thinking about, you know, you were saying about emailing, I think for this, over a year with four campaigns, I only sent five emails, five emails to my mailing list. Yeah. Because I was embarrassed. It didn't last for money, it's embarrassing. Yeah. But um, I did, so we did one yesterday. No. Yeah, the, I only sent one email for this last campaign, and that was yesterday. And that was because we'd got to the point where we were $9,200 funded, and it didn't feel like I was asking people to back a horse that wasn't going in. Because I think there's a real psychological thing. Are you going to make it? Okay, I'll come in. I'll do it with you rather than, no, I'm not going to get there. Yeah, so, yeah. It's a, I mean, yeah, that's about kind of timing and careful management, I suppose. Well, yeah, because it's about not trying to saturate, you know, you were saying about saturation. There was this blog post in Filmmaker Magazine last year because crowdfunding is much more established in the States, and it was called, I'm not going to fund your effing film. <laughs> <laughs> because every filmmaker going had a crowdfunding campaign. So, um, like I will fund, I've funded about six campaigns, I think, but I've been asked to fund about a hundred. Yeah. And that, and that comes back to this, it's a, it is a natural step, and for every hundred hits on your page, probably compared to one percent, I think, I think in ours it's about three um, percent. So, multiply that a hundred hits is usually a person that hit, looks at it in work and might look at it at home. You can put it down a little bit, but you do actually have to have a considerable amount of people look and just read or watch the video and, and see the page before they'll actually give money. And that is that's a that is a maths game as well. You've got to go, right, I've got to get that many people onto the site. I've got to think about the average pledge that they give. And this it builds into this whole budgeting process right at the beginning. And we're gonna have to wrap yeah, up. Just uh, just for uh, really it's uh, um, would you recommend, you know, or would you yourself uh, actually parse the funding, uh, you know, into the shoot and then the post in future? Would you recommend that people do that? Or split it up. Yeah, or, or because you did this uh, on the first film, yeah. Yeah. You know, or I know that was, that just happened that way. But would you plan to do that on, on subsequent projects? Um, I think if I've never done it before, yes, because I think that. I've seen a lot of campaigns fail because they're like asking for forty thousand dollars, and it's like totally unrealistic. And on Indiegogo, if you hit your target, you pay four percent fees. If you don't hit your target, you pay nine percent. And if you're on Kickstarter, you don't get anything if you don't reach your target. So I think the idea of testing it and being 
more realistic. And so our first campaign was three thousand dollars, and then we got four and a half because people will keep putting in if they want, if they like it. But that to us it seemed like that was the way to do it. But it is exhausting doing it over and over again. And my next film's um, traditionally funded through Storyville and Lucy Scott and Creative Scotland. And it's quite a relief to not <laughs> to not crowdfund <laughs> again. Um, if your film's a good fit, I would wholeheartedly recommend it because the surprises totally make it worthwhile. But if your film is have you got an audience? Have you got is it a subject matter that people want to talk about? Is there content that you can drive? Are you online? Are you using social networks? Have you got a website? How many people have you got on your mailing list? Can you be asked to do it? And have you got the capacity to help post things out? And if you haven't got all of those things, then it's too much work. It's really like a lot of work, especially if you're getting like the, our thing of like saying thank you to the donors is brilliant, but if you're getting donations from America in the middle of the night, how late do you want to work? And do you want to make your next film? But for me, it's been brilliant, and I don't think I'll do another one for two years. I don't think because I don't want to. I've got asking fatigue. I don't want to ask anymore. But I must say, at midnight last night when we hit the crowdfunding target. We got back to the hotel and I was crying. <laughs> Just so exhilarated. It's amazing. And also the things that come out of it. So this bloke I know who I went to school with didn't from the film, but he was aware of the film because of the crafting campaign. He works in customer services at Orange. This woman phoned up and she says, Oh my god, I was at the Biffers last night and I lost my phone. Is that you work in film? told her about my film and she's the programmer for the whole solo house group so she programmed my film because my friend knew about it and I'm not sure that that awareness it's a really you know small connection but if you're talking about your film at the point of you've not even finished making it the spread I really think that's why Senate Hours worked and grown and people have come along because they've been on board of the journey from day one.